we'll just bring the meeting to the Lord in prayer. Lord God Almighty, we come humbly once more into thy presence, Lord, and we do thank you that where the two and freezer gathered, there you are in the midst of them. And Lord God, we do thank you that we are free to meet here tonight. We are free to open thy word, to hear thy word preached, Lord. We do pray for our brother Andrew, Lord, that you would just use him mightily, Lord, for the fervence of thy gospel, Lord. Lord, that you would just inspire him, Lord, with thy word, Lord. That you would open up all of our hearts to receive thy word, that thy word would find a resting place. And Lord, we know that it teaches in thy word that thy word will never return void. So you do pray, Lord, that there be much fruit for the labours. And just pray, Lord God, that you would truly bless, that you would truly guide, that you would direct all of our hearts, that you would open our hearts. Lord, that we would cast away the curse of today, the worries of tomorrow, Lord, that we would focus our hearts and minds and bodies and souls upon you. Lord, that we would focus upon our eternal salvation, Lord. Lord, that we would just open our hearts, Lord, that you could use us mightily for the fervence of the gospel, Lord. And Lord, we just pray once more for those that are far from the kingdom of heaven, Lord. Just pray for those family members. Lord, I just plead for their salvation, Lord. Just pray, Lord, for those friends who are far from the kingdom, those, Lord, who time and time again have rejected you. But, Lord, I just pray that the scales would fall from their eyes, that they would realise that the only true salvation, that the only true happiness is through the cross, Lord. And, Lord, we just thank you that it is only through salvation and faith alone and Christ alone that we can enter into thy kingdom. And we thank you, Lord, for the finished work of Calvary. We thank you, Lord, for the simplicity of the gospel. We thank Thank you, Lord, that it is free faith, Lord. Lord, that no other method is good enough, that no other method can ever get us into heaven. Only through you, only by the cross of Calvary and faith alone. And Lord, we just thank you that we cannot earn our way, that we cannot buy our way. But humbly we must come before thee and bow the knee before the King of the before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And Lord, just pray that you would just use this meeting mightily, Lord, tonight, for the fervence of thy kingdom, Lord. And just pray that you would just touch those, Lord, who mourn tonight, Lord. Lord, that you would just touch Touch those, Lord, who are sick. I need a touch from the Master's hand, from the great physician. In all things, Lord, we just pray and praise that most wonderful and glorious and eternal name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Just be up, stand, and we'll sing. I stand amazed. 176. <laughs> Two. <laughs> One, two. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And
hand over to Andrew to take the rest of the meeting. It really is a privilege to have been asked to come here tonight and share with you. And uh, I speak in many churches and uh, quite a lot of the minister sits behind you. And it makes you terrible nervous, so it does, somebody sitting behind you. Uh, We'll just read a passage of scripture which is in Luke chapter 7. (coughs) Luke chapter 7, commencing at uh, verse 36. Now there was one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in the town learnt that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had any money to pay him back. So he cancelled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him the most? Uh, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt cancelled. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For she lived, loved most, for she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We'll just pray again if you don't mind. Heavenly Father, we do humbly bow before you and just ask for the help that's needed. I ask, Lord, for the clarity uh, to speak and bring forth something of the word that we know that you can make living I pray Lord for those that hear uh, if there's any unsaved here tonight that tonight would be, would, would be the beginning of a new life for them I pray Lord for those that are saved that those that are going through hard times that something that is said tonight will be encouraging and we pray in Jesus name Amen you know, this pulpit was made for giants. I'm six foot and I can hardly see over it. Uh, so I'm going to go around this other side, if that's all right, to speak. Suppose really I have to start by saying that there's nobody in here tonight that wouldn't have a problem in their life. Uh, that's because of the fall of man. We'll have health problems, relationship problems, money problems. You name it, we will all have problems. So when I speak to you, I'm not unique in any way, Uh, so I'm not, because I know that people will be going through the problems of life, because life is a problem at times. But when you know the Lord is your Saviour, there's a peace and a joy that passes all understanding, and even when you go through the problems of life, the problems aren't as exasperating or as giant as what they would be if you're unsaved. Suppose really why I read this passage of scripture tonight was that Simon uh, was a Pharisee so he knew all about God. Or he thought he knew all about God. He thought he also knew all about Jesus but he knew nothing about Jesus. And suppose really if I was to tell you that I started life uh, where I never can remember not having known that I needed to be saved. I knew about Jesus just like Simon knew about Jesus but I didn't know Jesus 
the way this sinful woman got to know Jesus. Is my father was English and uh, he, was, he lived in Essex and he was brought up there. And he was in the TA and at the outbreak of war he was immediately called up. And he was in expeditionary forces that went into France at the outbreak of war. And uh, them expeditionary forces, as you would know, were chased back to Dunkirk. And my father was unsaved. He didn't know anything about salvation. But he was chased back. And he told me many stories at the latter end of his life on the adventures it was, even on the retreat. And the number of times that they were strafed with the uh, Luftwaffe as they come in. And the many friends he had that died. He eventually, after four days, dug in on the beach. Uh, where his friends got killed around him. Uh, he got off, he swam out to a cruiser called the Ivanhoe and he was rescued by it. Got back to England and his first posting was Thiefwald Barracks in Lisbon. And then uh, one night he was out on the town I think and he met mum and during the war years they got married. So the D-Day was back again and he was in the second wave at Gold Beach which is Aramanch. Again, there's Lantern craft, the, the German e-boats were in among them by then, and his Lantern craft got hit, and he says one minute there was gunners up on the turrets of the Lantern craft, and the next minute they just disappeared. When they hit the beach, the front of his boat wouldn't go down because it had jammed with the explosion, and he escaped death there, and he fought through uh, France, so he did, he fought through Germany, he was in Holland, and he was the first <coughs> British regiment to be in Belsen. So my father saw Belsen, as you see Belsen on the television, he was there when all the bodies was there, and he escaped death, the Lord looked after him. After the war, he, when he was demobbed, they set up home in Lisbon, and he got a job driving a UTA bus, which some of you younger people don't know, like they're all young, what a UTA bus is, else they're transport authority, so it is. So he drove a bus, and in Lisbon depot there was quite a lot of Christian bus drivers, conductors, and inspectors, and they continually witnessed to him. So never stop witnessing to somebody and tell them they need to be saved. And eventually, in 1950, he was invited many times to a meeting, and he was invited to a meeting in the Christian Workers Union in Lisbon beside the McCall's Man Shop. And my father got saved in that meeting, and it was in the middle of the afternoon. And why he ever went, it must have been under duress, uh, but why he ever went, uh, I'll never know, and he really can't explain that himself, or he's passed away now. And he got saved, and that was in 1950. I was born in 1949, and I tell people I'm 56, so you can work that out yourself, so you can. Uh, so you, uh, so you, uh, now, uh, Simon, uh, in that story, Simon invited <coughs> Jesus to be with him, to dine with him. Whether he invited him to be critical of him, uh, we don't know, to make fun of him, we don't know. But it didn't look like he wanted to really get to know Jesus. And I sometimes think when I read that passage, I think of people who come to church. And so many people come to church. And if you come to church, whether saved or unsaved, you've invited Jesus to dine with you. You've asked Jesus to fellowship with you. So you have. And tonight we are here and we are fellowshipping with Jesus. So we are. If you're unsaved tonight and you're here, when you are here for whatever reason, but listen, Jesus accepted the invitation by Simon. So he did. Because Simon wasn't beyond salvation. Even though he was a Pharisee and didn't want to know about the Messiah. Didn't want to give up his uh, legalistic religion. So Jesus still spent time with him. And if you're unsaved here tonight, Jesus wants to spend time with you. You're here because he wants to spend time with you. He wants to save you. He wants to give you a better life. If you're here today and you're discouraged because of what you've went through in your life, he wants to spend time with you once again. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to dine with you. He wants you to recline with him at the table. So I was born in 1949. My father was among the brethren. He was in uh, Morris Avenue Gospel Hall, later then Derryocky Gospel Hall. So I never can remember ever not knowing I needed to be born again. So then father prayed for me, brought me to all the meetings and I used to really enjoy, particularly on a Sunday night my father preached around the wee halls and I used to enjoy 
uh, we didn't have a motor car, bus drivers couldn't afford motor cars, so they could really <coughs> Farmers could afford motor cars, and uh, we, uh, I used to love sitting in A40 Devons and uh, Ford Prefax and whatnot, it was just lovely. Went till we gospel halls around the country, and there was always a nice supper afterwards, and you can look back at that. And there's many nights I went home, and I was scared to go to sleep in case the Lord come during the night, and took my father away, and I'd be left, and I would go to hell forever or I would die during the night, but I never really understood what Jesus did for me on that cross. And you know, Simon didn't understand what Jesus was in the world for. He didn't understand that Jesus was going to live an absolutely perfect, sinless life, and that Jesus was only, the only payment for the sin of mankind and womankind. He was the only payment that God would accept for the sins of man. But I never really was explained to, it never was explained to me properly what Jesus did on that cross. And it was only in my adult life, when I was in business, I was doing a job just off of the Malone Road. And uh, this woman was uh, witnessing to me and it was quite annoying me. And was frustrating, I said, sure, what's the big deal, Christ dying on a cross? Many people have died worse deaths than dying on a cross. People have been skinned alive, boiled alive, ate alive, you name it. Man has invented so many ways to kill people. And she says, Andy, you've missed it. Crucifixion was bad. The whipping was bad. The spitting was bad. But what the cross was all about, in the hours of darkness when Christ hung there, he went to hell and was punished for you and I so that we would never have to go to hell and be punished for our sins. So he got punished for the sins of mankind so, he did, so that we would never have to go to hell for all eternity and be punished. And all we have to do is ask him into our lives to forgive us our sins and repent of our sins and we can spend eternity with him and we get a, a new life. And I never understood that. And you know, I call sometimes what I speak on life-changing days. And there is so many of us have days that change our lives forever. The day you lost a loved one, the day you got married, the day you had a child. There's so many days in your life you could say they're life-changing days. So I call this life-changing days. And I was brought to Sunday school, I was brought to church and I eventually started to hate it. I just could not be bothered with the whole thing. And I rebelled against it and when I got until probably 13, I can't just, maybe just a wee bit before, I wouldn't go to church any longer. I told my dad I wasn't going. And he was so disappointed. But life changing days, I was on my way to school one morning, and I think that I was 13, I may have been 12, my wife tells me I was 13, and uh, they were building a new estate uh, quite close to where we lived at a cottage. I had to pass the estate every morning. And they filled the houses up, uh, maybe a batch of 10 or 12 at a time. A new batch had just been filled up and I passed it this morning. And this girl came out of one of the houses looking for her dog. And I tell people, as soon as she saw me, she fell in love with me. So she did. How could she resist? this? And I fell in love with her too. And we went out together from, I was 13, she's older than me. Uh, she liked younger men. And uh, so she, is, she was 14 and we went out off and on for several years and eventually we got married. So that was a life change then. Getting married was a life change then. She never heard the word saved till she met me. Even though I wasn't saved, I knew I needed to be saved and I would have argued on that side if we ever had a discussion about religion. I would have said, look, you need to be born again, so you do. So anyhow, when we got married, we moved into a council house, so we did, and friends of mine, a guy that I went to Sunday school with, married a girl that I was sat in school with uh, in uh, De Murray, and uh, they lived, moved in near to us, and they were both saved, and then she invited my wife, we were only married about a year, invited my wife to a mission, and my wife got saved at that mission, so she did. So that was... 46 years ago that she got saved. Uh, we very quickly had a family. That was a life changing day, her getting saved. We quickly had a family with Mark, first of all, and then our second child died at birth. It was a full term pregnancy, and we don't know why it died. In them days, you wouldn't have been given the same information 
that you can now demand. So we don't, we had to bury that child, we called that child David. And then our third child was Jennifer who was murdered. And then our fourth child was Philip. I had went out into business on my own in my very early 20s, I was 22 years of age, went out into business on my own and business did well. And I saved up enough money to be able to buy two cottages out at Ballanderry, not the two cottages out in Quilt, the nice house, and we live in that house to this day. And when we moved out there, we were a very happy family, we were a prosperous family, we had enough money to live on, we were very happy. I worked hard and taught church to children. She saw all the children saved, she saw Mark saved, she saw Jennifer saved when she was nine, and she saw Philip saved also. And her health had started to break down. She was being a diabetic, so it's not long after we married, insulin dependent, and then she took rheumatoid arthritis. So her whole health broke down. She was in hospital uh, for uh, probably a woman's complaint, whatever that is. And she was in, and they told her never to have any more children, that it would be very dangerous for her to have more children. So they said, we would advise you to get sterilized. So she said she would think and she'd pray about it. She told me about it, and I said, well, I wouldn't ask you to do that. She prayed about it when she got home and decided that the Lord had led her to be circum, but to be uh, sterilized. She went into hospital again and got sterilized. And just about a year after she was sterilized, she came down one morning and she says to me, Andy, I'm pregnant again. And I says, how can you be pregnant again when you're sterilized? She went to the doctors eventually, and the doctor, I tell everybody this, the doctor told her it was a wee bug. So the wee bug's now 34 years of age, <laughs> not about our house. So that was a life-changing day. That was a miracle child. My wife was sterilized properly, proper operation. But the Lord gave us uh, Victoria, and Victoria is now 34. And she just loves us because in February she eloped and got married, so she really does love us. She rang us up, she went away on a Saturday and on a Friday, or a, a Tuesday, the following Tuesday she rang from Sweden. She was up in Lapland, just ringing, just ringing to tell you Andy and I have got married. Because of her boyfriend and Andy, we've just got married. So that was really good of her, wasn't it? So, uh, but listen, there's negatives and positives. It saved me a fortune. <laughs> I'm so glad that I don't have to spend that money on a reception. So, uh, so uh, life was good. Uh, we had a lovely family. We had four surviving children. And my business was good. I towed a caravan to the seaside weekends. And we just had a nice, I worked hard. And we just had a really nice, comfortable life. Certainly business wasn't easy at times, but listen, uh, we made enough money for it to justify it, and it was really good. Uh, Victoria had been born in December uh, 1980, and I'm going to move you on to uh, uh, I'm going to move you on till uh, August the 12th, 1981. Now, Pat. Uh, her faith was such and uh, I could see that she really was a devout Christian and I tried my best to work with her with her faith, I would have never worked on a Sunday uh, in all the years, in the 40 odd years I've been in business I've only ever had my business open once on a Sunday and that was a necessity uh, even long before I was saved and uh, I uh, always tried to get home on a Wednesday night and then <coughs> to her midweek and August the 12th, 1981, I got home early uh, to let Pat out for a midweek. And when I drive, drove into our drive and into our yard, Pat was standing at the back door and she was very, very worried looking. And I said, what's wrong with you? She said, well, Jennifer went out at dinner time on her bike and she hasn't come home and she used to be home at half past four. And I really wasn't worried. I said, well, what's wrong with that? And she says, I set her watch before she went and she's never late. So she's not. And I honestly was not worried, because children are children. And the reason why Pat hadn't went to look for Jennifer was that she'd had a puncture overnight in her car. So it was, and she had a back wheel flat. And I said, look, is the dinner ready? She said, yes, the dinner's ready. And I said, look, we'll have her dinner, and after dinner we'll go and see where Jennifer is. I wasn't worried. And sometimes it's very hard to explain to people. But in the country in them days, you could play football out in our road. The traffic was so light, 
And the word pedophile was not in our vocabulary, in truth. If somebody had said to me, he is a pedophile, I wouldn't have known what a pedophile was. And I think most of you would probably admit to the same thing. So there wasn't the danger that there is about now. The first thing, if you have a child missing now, you think immediately of the awfulness of that. So after we had dinner, uh, Pat and I decided I fixed the puncture and car, Pat's car changed the wheel. I still wasn't in any hurry. And Pat was very anxious. Come on, we'll go. So we went to look for Jennifer to the house that she said she was going to and she had never arrived. And I still wasn't worried. So we went round all the houses. I can't maybe tell you the exact format of what we did because it is now quite a long time ago. But eventually we ended up that there was no sign of Jennifer having arrived anywhere. So we went up to the police station which was a part time police station and we had a sergeant there that was just coming off duty and he uh, said that, I we said we had a missing child and he wasn't worried and I wasn't worried I knew she was missing but I never thought the worst so I didn't so he said look I hold on, look, look about for about another hour and come back and see me so we searched for another hour, me and some neighbours and Pat and Jennifer was nowhere to be seen went back to the police station and told the policeman, the sergeant, that we were now worried. And uh, he said, well, he said, the truthful, I'm now worried. And very quickly he got the Lisburn police, the UDR, and all the soldiers that were about. And very quickly it went round the neighbourhood. And very soon there was thousands of people out looking for Jennifer in the fields and in the lanes and round houses and up all sorts of derelict places. And about midnight, the weather turned very foul, it started to rain very, very hard, and about midnight, a neighbour of mine called Barry Hicklin, it used to be Hicklin's bicycle shop, and I live quite close to where Barry had the bicycle shop, came down, and he had one of these pickup trucks with a bar on the top with lights on it. And he inquired in what direction she had went, and uh, he got a man up on the back and he shone the lights, along the road, along the hedges, and not very far down the road from us, his lights picked up the reflectors on Jennifer's bike. It had been flung over the hedge, so we knew then that we had a problem, that Jennifer was definitely missing. So to describe what that's like is not in anybody's vocabulary. I cannot describe to you what it's like to walk into a bedroom, to see an empty bed where a child should be safe and sound, a loving little girl that wouldn't have known any badness. All she ever gave was love and all she ever received was love. She just was such a bright light. She got saved when she was seven. And the presence of the Lord was with her. And people would even say to us, even to this day, I can remember your wee girl coming into our house, you know. And a, a lady said to me, you know, she came into our house one day to play with our youngster. And there was a visitor in. And the visitor said, is that lovely wee girl she just had a brightness about her and there's no way that I can describe even what happens to your body when you get a shock like that there's just nothing that I could write or tell you that would give you that experience you would have to go through that yourself we searched for six days and uh, on the, later on the sixth day um, uh, my brother-in-law called with me and our house never stopped our neighbours were really lovely and uh, it was a great cross community thing because uh, the Roman Catholic people and the Protestant people just worked together so well in Ballandary there really wasn't any problems anyhow. And uh, we, uh, my brother-in-law called with me and he asked me, he says, look Andy come with me, we'll go down to the search headquarters in Ockley just to show you what they're doing. So I decided to go down with him when we got down there met the senior uh, officer in charge, which I knew, actually had done his kitchen. And uh, we were only there about five minutes and we were asked to leave very quickly. There was a flap on. And when we got back to the house, we then learnt that Jennifer's body had been found on the A1 between Dromore and Hillsborough. If you go from here down through Dromore and you're heading to Hillsborough, there's a, uh, on the left-hand side, there's a lay-by and you can now buy uh, food in there, there's always a mobile shop that sells burgers and all. In behind that's a lake called McKee's Dam and our body was found by two fishermen there 
and she had been in the water for six days and she had been sexually assaulted, strangled and then thrown into the water. And the awfulness of that is again unwordable. I cannot tell you what that was like. To have to go to Craig Avon Morgue and identify her body and all of what took place with the funeral and all is just something that cannot be described, just the horror of it. Almost. So that was a, certainly a life changing day and nobody was ever caught for a murder. It was an absolute blank. And during the time we searched for Jennifer, uh, we uh, would have had meetings in our house. I was very friendly with uh, William Beatty, who was a, free, was a Free Presbyterian minister. I just had, he was just a friend and uh, didn't go to his church or anything. He would have come at nights and we would have had meetings and people heard the gospel, people who were in for supper or in talking or people and there was dozens of people heard the gospel. We actually know people got saved through that. And you know, I knew that my daughter was in heaven. She was with the Lord and the comfort of that, even unsaved, was such a comfort to know that Jennifer was in glory, that Jennifer had seen what I now am hoping to see very soon. Well, life goes on. And you know, the Lord spoke to me through that, but I still rejected salvation. So I did. And as the bug grew up, she would have invited me to things that was all in the church children events, and Pat would have also. And I could not refuse this child anything, so I started to go back to church. And I get invited to give my testimony when there's a mission on, and maybe there's an evangelist preaching, and I will not give my testimony uh, in that way, because it's only with the Word of God. It's not me that saves people, it's the Word of God. So uh, I went to a church, an evangelical Presbyterian church in Crumlin. Andrew Woolsey was the preacher, he was an expository preacher. And the Word of God started to work on me once again. And I started to get concerned for my soul. Business was good, I had 20 men working for me, and uh, three or four girls in the office. And, you know, the fear of man comes in. So it does. And you know the wonderful thing about this story of this girl? This girl heard that Jesus was in the facility. And she got ready to go to see Jesus. So she did. She got the alabaster or whatever it was held in the ointment. The, the perfume. And she would have got ready to go. And the culture of the day was that this feast would have taken place in what we would today term as a carport out the side or out the back of the house. And people would have sat or laid down at the table, they reclined at the table, so they did. And they all was round them with some short walls, so there was. And the people, the culture of the day, the people of the town would have come and sat on the wall. Even though they weren't involved in the feast, they would have sat on the walls. And they would actually have carried on a conversation with those that were eating at the table. And this woman come in, in front of all of these people, this woman who was probably a prostitute, who had, Simon said she was a sinful woman. And she come in, so she did. And she went in front of everybody. And she wept and washed the Lord's feet with her hair. The fear of man had left her. So it had. She didn't any longer care what people thought. And you know what I'm going to tell you? The fear of man is going to keep more people out of heaven than any other sin. The pride and the fear of man will keep people out of heaven. <coughs> this woman lost all fear of man. She did. And one of my big problems was fear of man. 25 or 23 people working for you. A business partner. How do you go in and tell them that you're saved or concerned for your soul? How do you tell men that uh, wouldn't be sometimes polite with their language and whatnot? How do you tell them you've just got saved? How did I tell all my friends? How did I tell my wife that she's been right for all these years? You know, you think of it. Fear is in there. And this went on for some time, this 
conviction that I needed to give my life to the Lord. And I decided once September that I would take a few days off. And I took my rock, my tent and enough food for four days and I went up to Petticoat. And I walked from Petticoat up the side of Loch Derg, where the Roman Catholic people go and do their penance. Walked from Loch Derg up to Loch Esk and I stayed there the night. I camped at the night. A whole night at Loch Esk and all this time was just battling with the devil and with the Holy Spirit. And I so wanted to be saved, but I just couldn't take that step. So I couldn't. The next day I walked over the Blue Stack Mountains into the Glenfane National Park. And I walked too long. It was September. I walked short days and I walked too long into the night. So I did. Eventually pitched my tent and uh, had something to eat, cooked uh, a meal. So I did. And went to sleep. And I'm a very, very good sleeper. And during the night, a storm came in. And when I woke up, there was a storm. My tent is made that you can put it up in a storm. And I'm such a, I could sleep for Ireland. I sleep so well when I go to bed. And I woke up and the whole weather had changed. <coughs> Made myself from breakfast, packed up the tent, and the rain was horizontal. The wind was so hard. And visibility wasn't the width of this room. And if anybody has ever walked in a wilderness, you walk on bearings and triangulate bearings, so you do. And when I walked on the, into the night, I really didn't know exactly where I had finished. I couldn't have told you. My, I was going to rely the next morning to look at the peaks and look at this and then take uh, a look at the map and then know where I was. And I absolutely was lost. And I believe the Holy Spirit exaggerated that lostness in my mind. And I actually got frightened. And I can tell you, I've, I've practically never been frightened in my life. And I was frightened then. And I prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, if you get me to meet Patton from Cara that night on the, on the north coast, if you get me to Volcara tonight, I'll definitely go back to church every night until you either save me or reject you. And it was like the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I sat up there and I just, it was just like he spoke to my spirit. And I walked on that bearing and I brought Pat back to the place recently uh, where I climbed down a cliff into a plateau. And as I walked along the plateau on this bearing, I saw the bottom of Ericle sticking out of the mist. And Ericle's unmistakable because it's shingly. And I knew that I was in the poison glen. I knew where it was. And I got to Volcara that night. When I got home, I went back to church every Sunday night with Pat. And for over a year, I struggled. If anybody's here not saved and they're struggling, get it over with. Give your life to the Lord. Because you could pass away in the morning. So you could. And after a year, there was a mission on, and uh, 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 Andrew Woolsey and Caldwell Dara was taking the mission. And after the very last night of the mission, when I went home and everybody had gone to bed, I asked the Lord to save me. And he saved my soul. So it was, I was 44 years of age. I'd rejected the Lord for 44 years. My father had prayed for me for 43 years. So he had. So never give up praying for somebody. If they're unsaved. Now when I was going up the stairs to bed. Pat was in bed and the children were in bed. The devil started again. How do you know you're saved? For goodness sake, look at the life you've lived. You couldn't be saved. For, you asked to be saved when you were young. And the Holy Spirit cut him again. And my sister had been a missionary with WAC. And when she joined WAC, they give her a, they give her a decision to make that she would have to go to college. And they give her three colleges to go to. And she had to pray about which college would be the best college. And one day after she prayed, she read her Bible. And a verse jumped out of the Bible. She says, I saw that verse somewhere before the day. And when she looked at the, the, the literature on the colleges, the verse was over the gate of one of the colleges. So she knew that the Lord had spoken to her. And the Holy Spirit brought that. That was 25 plus years prior to me being saved. The Holy Spirit brought that till my mind and I said right Lord tomorrow morning after I've showered and shaved I want a verse to tell me I'm saved next morning after I've showered and shaved couldn't wait to go downstairs Pat's Bible was sitting on the worktop opened the Bible very first verse I read was praise ye the Lord sing unto the Lord because he has saved he has saved the soul of the poor from the hands of the evildoer and we were saved and I've never doubted it once and it took me three days to tell Pat you see the pride was still there so it was and it took me three days to tell Pat and other people. And I've never lived to regret it, so I haven't. And nobody had been caught for Jennifer's murder. Nobody had been caught for her murder. 
Right. And you know, I'm going to move you on to another uh, incident in the early 90s. We have known from the early 90s, even though it didn't come to trial until 2011, we have known from the early 90s who murdered our daughter. And we just had to sit and wait all them years and not let it frustrate us. On the Scottish borders, there was an old man working in his garden. Uh, he's now passed away. And his garden sloped away down to the road. And when he stood at the bottom of his garden and he stood up, his eyes would have been level with the road. If he bent down at the bottom of the garden, he wouldn't have been seen from the road. He was bent down working in his garden. I think he was working on his grass box or adjusting his mower. When he stood up, he noticed a van stopped across the road. And he saw a little girl come walking down the road as he watched. And he saw the little girl being abducted and bundled into the van, a transit van, and drove off to the east of the country. And he ran, he, wasn't, he was on the edge of the village, he ran to the local police station, two policemen on duty, told the two policemen what he'd seen. He saw a little girl being abducted and taken away. It was either a white or blue van, blue transit van, I can't remember. I'm going to have to read up on it again. But say it was a white transit van, and he said he saw this little girl bundled into the van and it headed off towards the east. So they put a lot of things into motion and then they went out on the road and stopped traffic coming from the east, travelling west. And eventually after about an hour, maybe a bit more than an hour, they stopped the van, they stopped the lorry, and they spoke to the lorry driver. And the lorry driver said when he was asked and he'd seen this trans van, he says, funny I have seen that van. And he says, what drew my attention till it is sitting on a disused quarry up the road? And what drew my attention till it is that there was a man got out of the back of the van and he was stripped to the waist. And I thought that was quite rare. So they let the lorry driver go and they were discussing what to do next. And the van came down the road, stopped the van and one of the policemen entertained the driver. And the other one got into the back of the transit van and he could see nothing that worried him. And he's just about to leave the van again. He saw a bundle of rags at the top of the van move. And when he up, he pulled back the rags. In underneath the rags was a sleeping bag tied at the top. And inside the sleeping bag was a little girl. And she was tied, her hands and her feet and her mouth was all taped. And if he hadn't rescued her, she would have died of suffocation within the next 15 to 20 minutes. So he would. And he would have murdered her anyhow. So he would. And two things to the story is that the policeman who rescued the little girl, it was actually his daughter that had been abducted, so he saved the life of his own daughter. So he did. And the other thing, in the hour that he had that little girl, or just over an hour, he sexually abused her in ways that you wouldn't even have in your imagination. And I mean that. You would not have in your imagination. Sexual perversion or paedophilia. It, it, every one of us would have an idea what that means, but you really don't, in truth. You really do not know what it's all about and what he did to that little girl. So they eventually started to follow uh, a trail. He was based in London as a delivery man, and they started to look at where he delivered. And they started to notice that they held him that little girls had get, gone missing in areas that he had been. They then decided that they would look at the petrol receipts and in them days uh, people would remember credit cards now as a pin but in them days you put your credit card into a machine and they swiped it and you got printed off a carbon copy, I'm sure somebody remembers that and that was all stored in a thing called microfiche so it was and they went into the archives of the petrol company <coughs> And they looked through millions of entries on microfiche and they eventually were able to follow Robert Black round the country and where he had been. He eventually was uh, convicted of three murders and two abductions. And then the paper trail led to Northern Ireland. And on the day that Jennifer was missing, <coughs> Robert Black was in the province. So it was only a matter of trying to prove that. So we knew from the early 90s that he eventually would come to the province. Eventually he came to Lantrum uh, Crime Suite to be uh, questioned. And we got our church to pray. And we got other people to pray. He was able to tell the senior policeman, even though he wasn't a saved man, that there was a whole church praying for him. 
and for the team. The two people who interviewed him, one was a woman, a police woman, and one a man, and they had been trained by psychologists and psychiatrists how to speak to this man. And they had sat in behind a one-way mirror on all the interviews that he had went through in the precincts prior to that. So they knew what they were up against. And on a sliding scale of 1 to 10, the highest he'd ever scored was 3. Once he was put under pressure, he will not give anything away. Apparently these people, uh, what they've done is their property, they hold on to it. And on a sliding scale of 1 to 10, the highest he ever scored was 3. We prayed, and that morning, Pat's reading was Balaam's donkey, and how the ass had spoken. And Pat rang me, and I rang the senior policeman, and told him that this man will say more today than he was ever said before. And you know what? They, they didn't believe me. The sliding scale of 1 to 10, he scored 9. So prayer does work. Eventually went to court. But there's a lot of things in between life-changing days. In 2004, the bug was travelling in uh, Australia and she had a very bad accident and she broke her neck in three places. And I can remember it was the Wednesday, the first Wednesday we were back at work after Christmas 2004. And I can remember driving into my yard and my son was standing in the yard and he was as white as a sheet. And when I got out of the car I knew someone I said, what's wrong? And he says, I have a bad some very bad Italian. I said, what's wrong? He says, Victoria's had a very bad accident and she's broke her neck in Australia. And I have to tell you, it's the only time in all my Christian life that I actually lost faith. I actually lost faith. So I did. For I don't know how many minutes, I can't tell you, but eventually the Holy Spirit came in again and revived me. And then we learned later on that day that she was in hospital and her spinal cord had not been snapped but her neck was broken in three places and she would be in traction for three months in Australia. So Pat and I had to organise to go out to Australia. And you see after I had that day organised I rang a travel agent friend of mine who runs a travel agency he got me booked from Belfast to London, from London <coughs> to Singapore, from Singapore to Dubai, from Dubai Till, uh, Brisbane, from Brisbane to Rockhampton. He got that all organised for me. And later that night, I went out, I'm a runner, I went out for a run. And as I ran down the road, rejoicing because the Lord had not allowed her to be crippled, I run down the road, the shock was so bad that every bone in my body hurt. And I mean that. There wasn't a bone in my body that wasn't painful. The shock of that was just so awful. I think that was one of the worst days of my life because when we lost Jennifer, it was a progression. But that was just so sudden. And Victoria survived that. She was three months in hospital and traction, couldn't move. But she survived. <coughs> Pat had to live out in Australia for three months. Uh, near killed Pat with rheumatoid arthritis, high humidity, 40 degrees every day on that. Capricorn Coast was just awful for us, and that wasn't a nice time to go through. And then in April 2011, uh, March 2011, I took ill, and I never was ill in my life. I ended up in intensive care, almost died in intensive care. I never once had a day off sick. And I collapsed and was brought in to high dependency, and then eventually put into Dundonald into uh, intensive care. And when I come round intensive care, <coughs> I knew I was almost dead and I said to the Lord, I said, I'm ready to go. Is anybody here not saved? You'll not be able to do this. I said, I'm ready to go. And I said, just take me home if it's my turn. And I lay back and the presence of the Lord come upon me. I just wallowed in his presence. I just wallowed. Drifted off into unconsciousness again. And see, when I come round again, I was sorry I was alive. Such was the presence of the Lord and the beauty of the presence of the Lord. There's other life-changing days even from that, but the trial was uh, started in September, October 2011, and the first three days was held in the Avon Crown Court where they picked a jury, and uh, then they had legal arguments for two days. The prosecution obviously wanted to be able to introduce 
his previous crimes. The defence obviously didn't want that, so they did. And they argued that in the end, the judge uh, ruled that they were not allowed to use his bad character evidence until they, the prosecution proved that he was in the province on the day that Jennifer went missing. I thought that was fair enough. But during that time, we were unwarned that we would have to listen. This is without a jury now. That we would have to listen to the tapes of him being interviewed. And why he liked little girls and why and how and what he wanted to do little girls. And it was unbelievably shocking. It was so shocking that it was so shocking that it, and revolting that it just broke Pat's heart and my heart. We just could not get over it. And I remember on the Wednesday when that was over we went home and all we wanted to do was just be on our own in that house after listening to that awful, awful thing. And the Holy Spirit come in again. That verse in Hebrews, never forsake the gathering of yourselves together. So we went to our midweek prayer meeting and the love and the help we got in that prayer meeting. So brothers and sisters, never forsake your brothers and sisters when you're in trouble because they will help you. So they will. It went to trial then after that in Craig and uh, and uh, Armagh Crown Court and it was six weeks long and he eventually was convicted of Jennifer's murder and the presence of the Lord was with us every day and the presence of the Lord was in the court and he brought us through it he never left our side and I mean that and you know when it was finished uh, we tried not to meet the press beforehand and then we had to meet the press we had to meet the police man that looks after the press if you want but I can't remember what you call him their PR man and he says to me Andy you're going to meet the press tomorrow it doesn't matter what the verdict is you're going to meet the press tomorrow whatever you do don't wing it he says you go home tonight and you write out what you want to say and then you read that out and you know again the Holy Spirit spoke not for me that and I said I had no doubt that he I knew he would be convicted and when we met the press and the questions Pat and I was answered, the Holy Spirit spoke for us and witnessed, uh, witnessed the Lord through us. And I mean that. Jennifer's wee life was very short, nine years of age, but her wee life has achieved so much because this was the first case in British history where similar fact evidence convicted this man of his murder. In other words, his fingerprint of what he did previous to little girls was the same fingerprint of what he did to Jennifer and that's how he was convicted. Obviously they knew he was in the province at the time. And it was such a joy to know that he will never be out of prison again. And when we were in that court, when it was over and everybody had gone home, I went into the court and the clerk of the court was sitting there, girl in her fifties, Grace she called her in the embassy, Grace to say cheer with the Grace. And we befriended all of even his barristers, his his these lawyers were big guns from England on £1,700 a day, uh, both his, the prosecution and the defence lawyers. And his, his defence lawyer could not understand me speaking to him. He actually spoke to other people who couldn't understand me being friendly to him. But in the end I brought him round and he spoke to me every day. <coughs> and uh, I went into the sea, Grace, and I said, she said, I'm going to tell you Andy before you go. She says, I'm in this court, I think it was 30 something years. She says, I've never sat through anything like that in my life. She says, I've never seen a presence like that. She says, I've never seen a whole jury cry. I've never seen a whole police force cry. I've never seen the prosecution and the defence cry, lawyers cry. I've never seen the press cry. And she says, I've never cried before myself. Such was the presence and peace that the Lord brought about during that trial. So eventually uh, he appealed and we had to wait on an appeal and in January of last year we had to sit through another three days and when you condensed his crimes and he was into self-harm and he was a photographer, he would have taken a picture of himself in the mirror when he was self-harming and when you condensed what he did to little girls into a three hour speech, it was just so awful. 
This man never once, his appearance never changed. He never once was embarrassed with some of the things that he did and it was said in court that he did to himself. He never once was embarrassed. Then after, I don't know, Lord Chief Justice took uh, several months for a verdict. Again, I had no problem with that. I knew he would still, his appeal would be turned down. And as I sat in the court this way, he sat just uh, like here looking, but he was a wee bit further away from me. And I watched him on occasion. He watched me quite a lot. And you know, he never once showed any remorse. And you see when his appeal was turned down, and he never, he never changed. He didn't say after. Oh, he just did not change. And when they lifted him to his feet and they put the big shackles on, massive shackles on his arms, one to each officer, let him out past me. I have to tell you, I saw hell go past me. And I mean that, I saw hell. And it broke my heart to see a man who gave himself over to depravity and has, has allowed the devil to have a grip on him like that to bring him to hell. But it's no different tonight. If you're here and you're unsaved, the devil has you. And the devil wants to bring you to hell. So he does. He wants you never to know Jesus. He will give you all the arguments of the day. He gives Simon all the arguments of the day. And the Lord Jesus Christ hit it on the head. And he said about the two people who owed money, the two men, and couldn't pay. They needed a banker. They needed somebody to bail them out. And you and I can't pay for our sin. We can't work for to be forgiven our sin. We can't pay to have our sins forgiven. We need a banker and that banker is Jesus Christ. So it is. And he is the only payment for our sin. And you know the wonderful thing about this story? You know, the Lord, there's so much, if you could preach an hour in this story, but so much, the Lord Jesus said... Your faith has saved you. It's faith alone and Christ alone, as Paul says, is the only way into heaven. But listen, he told her to go in peace. And when you know Jesus as your saviour, you should have that peace. And if you haven't that peace, you can have it if you're saved. And I have a daily peace to have. Every day I have a peace. Every day I wake up. doesn't matter what's in front of me. I have the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. And I have that peace. Because I have learnt how to tap in to that peace. To have. And it's the most wonderful feeling to lie down at night. And just thank the Lord for another wonderful day. And it's so wonderful to be able to stand up here. And bring some of the scripture to you. And tell you about Jennifer's wee life. And just how so many people have been reached and saved because of Pat's testimony and my testimony talking about how she lived her life. So her wee life is now still saving people. And before I finish, I've got to tell you, I always tell a wee story. I'm a great believer in the baptism or the filling of the Holy Spirit. So um, I've got to tell you a wee story because people don't believe that People say that you can only be spoken to by the scriptures or you can be spoken to by another Christian. But the Lord speaks to your spirit. And once you tap into that, you get guided and directed by the spirit. So you do. And I tell the story. I tell many stories. Sometimes I repeat them. But I'll tell you the story about uh, driving from... Uh, my mother is very elderly. and She likes to be run out in the car. And I got home one Saturday and I said... I said, we'd like, she lived, I have a flat built on my house from my parents lived there. <coughs> my father passed away and mother was living there. And I said, we'd like to be run out in the car. She says, yes, I'd love to go to Donegal. It was November and it was in the middle of the day. She wanted to go to Donegal town. So my sister wanted to go and her husband wanted to go. And Pat said she would go. So off we head about 2 o'clock in November to Donegal town. Got to Donegal town, it was nearly dark. So it was, and the ladies had a wee walk around the shops. Then we went into one of the hotels and we had a meal. We had a lovely meal. Dark, maybe 7 or 8 o'clock, we decided to head home. We head down to Ballyshannon. We headed from Ballyshannon over to Balik. And we're heading from Balik over to Fermanagh. And I have an automatic car. I had a Mercedes at the time, automatic. 
and I was driving along probably about 50, 60, 70 mile an hour and uh, weaving in and out round the roads, the car was handling just beautifully and the Lord spoke to me and the Lord says Andy go a wee bit slower because you could hit and kill an animal and I immediately put my foot on the brake so the and I nearly put, even though they're all seat belted, I nearly all put them through all the windscreen. And a full sized deer ran across the road in front of me. And if I hadn't had my foot in the brake, I'd have hit the deer and I could have been killed. And I could keep you going all night with stories how the Holy Spirit has guided and directed me. And how he gives me peace. And how he gives me joy. And how it's so wonderful to be saved. And if you're not saved tonight, you haven't given your life to the Lord. <coughs> Don't put it off another day. Start living a real life with purpose and with joy. If you're saved, I'll repeat it again. And you haven't that joy. You know, I think of the Lord Jesus Christ coming down off the Mount of Transfiguration. And he glowed up there. When he come down, he still glowed. So he did. And I meet people who are glowing. I do street outreach on a Saturday afternoon in Lisbon and I meet people who are saved and they're glowing I can tell them coming down the street they're saved but listen when the Lord Jesus Christ came down he was glowing <coughs> but the first thing he met when he was down there was an argument with the Pharisees and the disciples when they couldn't heal little lad <coughs> so life's not easy but the Lord Jesus Christ still glowed and I hope I still glow and I hope someday you will all glow because quite a lot of you do actually do so thanks very much. I went over my time, but you were all very late, so hard luck. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andrew, for that wonderful testimony. Um, just asked a question around the room tonight. Are you saved? <coughs> we all can put obstacles in the way why we can't come to the Lord. We might have difficulties in our life, but Andrew can show that the greatest difficulties, the biggest uh, obstacles put in the way, the Lord can still reach th through those and save us. And it's only by putting your trust in the Lord that you can know that joy that Andrew spoke of. So if you're not saved tonight, please consider it. Please con pray about it because the Lord gives you that peace, gives you that joy. And it's only through that that you can have that peace and joy. Thank Andrew for coming along. Really great testimony. Um, and good to see so many here tonight. There is supper downstairs. We hope there's enough supper for everyone. Please, everyone, stay behind. Chat to Andrew. Chat to any of us. And um, just one, one other thing. Um, Andrew said about outreach. There were a number of, of brethren here last week from Donegal and Fermanagh. And they are trying to outreach into County Kevin. They've bought property in County Kevin to do outreach. And... Um, but the, the finances are low, so maybe if the return collection tonight would be uh, to help those brethren. Um, they've oh, a big undertaking they've, they've taken. They've gone around a number of churches in the area as well, and they're prepared to come to outreach in that area. Uh, it's an area that's thirsting for the gospel. As I said at the meeting here tonight, if you give a tract out in Northern Ireland, five yards up the road, it's laying on the ground. You give a tract out in the Republic of Ireland, it's taken away, it's red. There's a thirst for the gospel there. So uh, please pray for those brethren as well as the work that they're doing. There'll be a bucket or a, a plate downstairs after the, the supper. Please uh, give generously for the work that they're doing in, in County Kevin. Um, we'll sing uh, one more piece, Just As I Am, number 354. And then if Trevor will just close with a word of prayer and also give thanks for the food. 354. <coughs> Just be upstanding and can have somebody, a good singer to lead because there's no good singers over here. <laughs> Just as I am with us.
that's the sort of testimony. So Lord, uh, uh, thank you, Lord, that you've been with them. Lord, he has had many sufferings. And Lord, he can say like Jacob, all these things are against us. But Lord, we thank you when we have God on our side. We have that great comforter. Lord, even in any trials and difficulties and uh, bereavements and uh, all that face us, Lord, we thank you to have God with us, God right by our side. And Lord, we thank you even uh, through the death of Jennifer, Lord, that many souls has come to Christ. Oh Lord, we do pray that you'll uh, bless our brother, continue with him, continue to bless him and his family, Lord, and undertake for them. And Lord, we pray that you'll uh, bless each one by my presence tonight. Lord, we do say that uh, in the, the hymn, O Lamb of God, I come. Lord, we pray that each one of us uh, will come uh, to faith in Christ, the faith that young Jennifer had, the faith that her brother uh, here has. O Lord, we pray that you'll uh, bless each one. Lord, that you'll unite us in Christ. And Lord, you'll draw us to that Lamb of God, uh, which does take away the sin of the world. Lord, do continue with us tonight. We pray that you'll bless our further fellowship around this cup of tea. We thank you for the fruit that has provided. We thank you for uh, uh, the blessing. Lord, we pray after that you'll take each one to our different homes in safety and abide with us where we abide and go with us where we go. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'll continue to keep thy hand upon each one of us. We we'll ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Thank you.